and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Quinquagesima Sunday. Ooh. Now, don't wor- Quinquagesima is not a new COVID variant. Don't worry. Uh, I, I, it's actually the older name for this Sunday, the final Sunday before Lent. It's called Quinquagesima Sunday because it is Quinquaginta, 50 in Latin, days before Easter. In the older calendars, the gospel appointed for Quinquagesima Sunday was always the story of Jesus healing a blind man on the road to Jericho. But in the liturgical reforms of the 20th century, the gospel was changed to the story of the transfiguration that we heard today. And so now, every Sunday before Lent, we hear the story of Christ upon the mountaintop, transfigured in front of Peter, James, and John, who fall on the ground and are overcome by this experience of divine glory in their friend and teacher, Jesus Christ. So today we normally call this the Sunday of the Transfiguration. It's because of the glory of the Transfiguration narrative that we're also given the Hebrew Bible reading for today from the book of Exodus, which is kind of a bizarre story, isn't it, right? Does anyone else feel like that? The story of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the tablets of the Ten Commandments in his hand. That's sort of normal. We expect that with Moses. We're told, though, that Moses didn't know it, but that the skin of his face was shining because he'd been talking with God. And that shining terrified everyone, rightly so. I would be scared. Uh, But Moses told them to come near. He told them of the commandments God had given them and then... He covered his face with a veil, always wearing it from then on when he was around the people, because you don't want to scare people if you're a minister, generally. (laughs) But then taking the veil off when he would go in before God to speak with God. And if you think that's a bizarre story, (laughs) you would have been even more confused had you heard that story in Latin before the Reformation and translations into English. Because St. Jerome, when he translated the Hebrew Bible into Latin, he translated the Hebrew differently than our English has translated it. Jerome wrote that when Moses came down from the mountain, quod cornuta eset facia sua. Or in English, Moses did not know that his face was horned from the conversation with God. Yes, you heard that right. They thought Moses had horns from talking with God. This is why Michelangelo's sculpture of Moses, if you've ever seen it, in that sculpture, Moses has horns coming out of his head. It's what they thought the Hebrew Bible said. And to be fair, horns are the more natural translation of the Hebrew word used, Quran. But what was likely intended is not horns, but kind of rays of light shining from his face, hence our more modern translation. But still pretty weird, right? Now, right about now, I would imagine you were sitting there wondering why in the world Father Jared is talking to us about Queen Quagesima and translations of horns. How in the world does this have anything to do with my life? Fair question. What I want to do is to draw you to the very strange nature of these things, the very strange nature of the church, the strange nature of the transfiguration of what we're remembering on this holy day, Because the transfiguration is a story we've heard over and over again. It doesn't seem very strange to us anymore, though it is. I mean, the idea that that Jesus, this backwoods rabbi, stood on a mountaintop and Moses, the great lawgiver, and Elijah, the great prophet, appeared with him and spoke with him. The idea that this rabbi's entire body was shot through with the radiance of God's light. All of this is actually rather strange and bizarre. The idea that any human could blaze with the brightness of the very glory of God is strange. It's probably why Peter and James and John didn't tell anyone about this after the fact. And Paul's insistence, his insistence in the epistle reading for today, that you, beloved of God, are also being transformed into the very glory of God from one degree of glory to another, or as the colic for today says, that you are being changed from glory to glory until you also will shine with God's glory. This is odd and strange. 
as well. I think the literary context of Exodus 34 might help us find a way in, though, a way into these strange and bizarre images and stories. Because if you know your Exodus narrative, or if you remember the Ten Commandments or Prince of Egypt, if, re if watching movies about the Bible is more your thing than reading it, then you would know that this is not the first time Moses brought the people the tablets of the law, right? The first time, while Moses was up on the mountaintop receiving the law, the people got tired of waiting for him, tired of waiting for their God. They wanted something to worship, and so they had Aaron make them a golden calf. And they worshiped the golden calf, and they engaged in the religious ecstasy of idolatry and reveling, chasing pleasure instead of patience. Do you remember the story? Remember God saw what happened with the people as he was up on the mountain with Moses and his anger burned against the people. He wanted to destroy the people of Israel, but Moses begged God to relent, not to destroy the people, but to give them a chance to repent. But then when Moses came down the mountain and saw the sin for himself, he threw the tablets to the ground, shattering them in the same way the people had shattered their, co their covenant with God. He took the calf, burned it, ground it into powder, and made them drink the results of their sin. He condemned them for this chasing of pleasure instead of waiting patiently for the one true God. And, and God didn't destroy the people, but God did send a plague upon the people as punishment. And after that plague, the people of Israel begged God. They begged God to forgive them, to give them another chance to be God's people. And Moses went into the tent of meeting outside the camp and talked with God face to face, the way a person would talk with a friend. Moses asked God, please stay with this sinful people. He asked for God's presence to go with them as they moved through the wilderness on their way to God's promises. And God said he would do this. He would stay with the people. But then Moses said one of the boldest things any human in Scripture has ever said. He wanted confidence that God would stay with the people. And so he said to God, then show me your glory, I pray. Now, if you remember, at the beginning of Exodus, in chapter 3, when Moses first encountered God in the burning bush, Moses hid his face in fear of the glory of God. But now Moses is asking to see the glory of God himself. And God responded to Moses' request, saying that he would hide Moses in the cleft of the rock. He would cover Moses with his own hand and that his glory would pass by Moses. He told Moses to cut two new tablets of stone and that God would write the commandments of the law on these two tablets with his own finger. So Moses went up to Mount Sinai once more. God descended in the cloud once more and stood with Moses, proclaiming his name and revealing his glory. And do you know what God said when he revealed his true self to Moses in all of his glory? He said, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And then God wrote the commandments on the tablet once more. And Moses stayed there with God, stayed with God for 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain, not eating, not drinking anything. And after that, in our reading, Moses came down from the mountain, his face shining with God's glory from this experience. You see, what I love about this story is that one of the most profound experiences of God's revealed presence here on earth occurred in the midst of the profound failure of God's people. And when God gave the commandments to Moses, God made it clear that God's law of love and justice is not simply a set of rules to hang up in your house or set up on a courthouse lawn, but that the commandments are rooted in the person of God in God's relationship with God's people, undeserved though they are.
The commandments of God are rooted in God being a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, a God who invites his people, who invites you to be merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The commandments of God are about inviting you to take on the very character of God in your lives. You see, you see the, the wonderful secret, the wonderful mystery of the transfiguration is this, beloved child of God, that you are also being changed. You are being changed just like Moses was changed. Since the day you were born, since the day baptismal water touched your skin, God's love has been working on you, helping you to reflect just a little bit more of the glory of God's love and justice in your own life. You may not shine with God's love and justice in such a way that the people are terrified that you need to wear a veil to cover yourself, but God's glory is burning in you. And the more that you are changed, then the more your love and justice will look strange to the ways of this world. And so as, as we approach the start of Lent in just a few days, a time when we reflect on our own mortality, a time when we are penitent, penitent for our sins and failures, I'd urge you to remember that it was in the midst of the failure of Israel that God revealed his glory to God's people. I would urge you to remember that the original three apostles didn't know what was going on when they met God's glory in their own life, when the, transfigure, when the transfigured light of God shone around them. Which is why Peter suggests maybe we should build some tents to house these divine beings. You see, God's glory will come to you in your life not because of your perfection, not because you understand things perfectly, not because of your righteousness. God's glory and love comes to you in your life, particularly in your worst moments, particularly when your failures seem the most profound, when you feel like you have hit bottom. That is when God so often chooses to reveal God's self to you, to invite you to stand up and try again to be changed just a little more into the likeness of God. And if you will not run from that glory, not hide your face from a God who loves you, a God who is willing to go to the ends of the earth, to the depth of your failure to find you, if you will not run from that glory, you will be changed by it. Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights being present with God, fasting, learning God's call upon his life and God's call upon the life of God's people, being filled with and surrounded by the glory of God, so much so that his very face shone with that glory. And beginning this Wednesday, you are invited to do what? Spend 40 days with God. Not 40 days to do some spiritual home improvement projects you've been putting off. Just maybe taking something up or giving something up. No, you're invited to spend 40 days living a bit more simply, absolutely. But doing that so that you can be present with God. So that you can try to hear a little more carefully God's call on your life. God's call for this world that you are invited to be a part of bringing about. To reflect upon the way that God's loving relationship with you is calling you to live differently so that you can experience more fully God's love for you, a glorious love that holds you even now. As one scholar says, what we see in all of this is the intimacy of faith. The closeness of God that is the defining factor in the transfiguration. Our closeness to God molds who we are. It is proximity to the divine that enables us to embody and radiate God's love. It is closeness to Jesus that calls and sustains us to do the right thing. Cultivate that closeness in these 40 days. Or as the 14th century German, Mr. Me German mystic Meister Eckhart once said, do not think to find holiness upon doing. Holiness must be founded upon being. Works do not make us holy. It is we who will make works holy. It is who you are. 
is a glorious child of God. It is the more you let that glory shine in your own life that your works will be sanctified into the very holiness of God, a holiness our world needs right now. A holiness that is already present in you if you will open yourself up and let yourself be changed little by little so that when people encounter you they cannot help but see the light of God's love in your life. They cannot help but see the fire of God's justice burning in you. You are being changed from glory to glory. And I cannot wait to see who you will be at the end of these next 40 days. Amen.